Horizon Forbidden West possesses many new systems, features and improvements since Zero Dawn. And in this video, I'll be covering everything you need to know about the most enjoyable aspect of the game, combat and weapons. If you're brand new to the series or a previous player wishing to brush up on all the finer details, then this video was made for you. There's two different categories of damage that can be dealt in Forbidden West. These are what I'll refer to as direct damage and the more visually discernible elemental damage. The four different types of direct damage are impact, melee, tear and explosive. Impact damage, represented by this downward arrow icon, refers to the common baseline damage for most ranged weapons in the game. Impact damage primarily reduces enemies' health as well as destroying machine components. Melee damage, represented by two crossing spears, refers to all close-range damage dealt by humans or physical attacks dealt by machines, such as tail swipes or body slams. Tear damage, represented by this broken shield icon, is a special type of damage that doesn't reduce enemies' health, but depicts a weapon's ability to successfully dislodge machine components as well as detach protective armor plates. While tear itself doesn't deal any direct damage, tearing components off a machine will always deal a fixed amount of damage, and is often applied alongside other sources such as impact or elemental damage. Over the course of a fight, component removal damage can add up significantly. But bear in mind, if the impact damage rating of a weapon is higher than its tear damage rating, components will always be destroyed rather than removed. So if your goal is to successfully tear off components for resources, check the tear damage rating of your weapon is much higher than its impact damage rating. The final direct damage type is explosive damage, designated by this red explosion icon. When you simply want to deal large amounts of highly destructive raw damage to enemies, explosive is the way. As a bonus, it completely ignores damage reduction from armor plating. But the payoff is it doesn't deal bonus damage when hitting weak spots or components. However, the wide blast radius of explosive damage makes it easy to destroy otherwise hard to hit components such as sacks or power generators hidden from view, such as on a machine's belly. Just bear in mind when hitting components on machines with explosives will always destroy them rather than remove them, destroying any resources in the process. Explosive damage is also particularly effective against tougher human enemies and can quickly strip them of their protective armor. So when it comes to infiltrating rebel camps and outposts, be sure to save some explosive ammunition for these tanky individuals. There's a total of six elemental damage types that Aloy can deal with her weapons. These are fire, frost, shock, purge water, acid and plasma. Most enemies in the game will possess weaknesses and resistances to these various elements. There's an additional two non-elemental statuses that deal no damage but utilize the same build-up mechanic. These are Adhesive and Berserk, which I'll be covering shortly. Purge Water, Plasma, Adhesive and Berserk are all new to Forbidden West and were not featured in Zero Dawn. When Aloy deals elemental damage to enemies with her weapons, a circular build-up meter fills with color above the target. How quickly this meter fills will depend on the elemental build-up strength of your weapon and the target's weakness or resistance to the element being afflicted. As soon as the build-up meter is completely filled, the elemental limit is reached, which causes the enemy to briefly stagger and a special state associated with that element is triggered. This elemental state remains active for a limited time, which is indicated by the gradually declining white circle that appears around the build-up meter once the elemental limit is reached. If Aloy stops dealing elemental damage for several seconds before the build-up meter fills, it'll start to slowly decay over time and disappear, requiring you to start the whole build-up process again. Though you can have up to three different elemental states building up simultaneously, only one elemental state can be in effect at any one time. The most recent element to reach its elemental limit will immediately replace any previously active state that was in effect. Once the elemental limit has been triggered and the white circle timer has begun, any additional damage from the same element type will not provide any additional effects, nor cause the active state to decay any slower. This very rare Seeker Hunter Bow can utilize three distinct ammo types, 
First, we have advanced hunter arrows. An advanced version of an ammo type will always be designated with this small up arrow on its icon. Hunter arrows deal regular impact damage as well as an associated tear rating displayed below. You can check the type of ammunition these icons represent by opening your weapon wheel during gameplay. The highlighted ammo's crafting requirements will also be displayed below the weapon wheel. The second and third ammo types compatible with this weapon are regular Frost Hunter arrows and advanced Frost Hunter arrows. Although advanced ammo types are significantly more powerful, they require more and much rarer resources to craft. The top figure represents the amount of elemental damage the arrow will deal to a target's health, and the lower number represents the amount of elemental buildup the ammo will inflict to fill up the elemental gauge. The higher this buildup rating is, the quicker the gauge will fill. The exact same mechanics apply to all other elemental and status ammo types in the game. It's worth noting that even if a machine is highly resistant to a specific element, if they're fitted with components susceptible to a chain reaction of that element, then hitting these components with the matching elemental damage type will cause a massive explosion inflicting the associated elemental state while ignoring the resistance rating of the machine. For example, hitting sparkers or power cells with shock damage will always inflict the shock state, hitting blaze canisters with fire damage will always inflict the burning state, hitting chill water canisters with frost damage will always inflict the brittle state, and hitting acid canisters with acid damage will always inflict the corroding state. In addition, components that are marked as explosive, designated by the explosive icon displayed at the top, will explode when hit with regular impact damage, unlike chain reaction canisters which require the matching elemental state to trigger. Explosive components will always detonate with a huge explosion when destroyed, and can also inflict permanent elemental states and or disable certain attacks and abilities. For example, destroying the chill water unit on a frost claw will inflict a permanent brittle state and disable all of its frost attacks. Destroying the blaze unit on a fire claw will inflict a permanent burning state and disable all of its fire attacks and destroying the chill water sack on a snap maw will cause a large AOE frost explosion and disable all of its frost attacks. Inflicting enough fire damage buildup to reach the elemental limit will briefly stagger a machine and apply the burning state. This will steadily deal damage to its core health over time, ignoring any armor plates. Smaller machines will receive 50 damage over 10 seconds, medium-sized machines will receive 180 damage over 15 seconds, and larger machines will be dealt 360 damage over 20 seconds. The burning state itself is far less effective than in Zero Dawn. However, fire arrows are still worthwhile for triggering susceptible components with elemental chain reactions such as blaze canisters. When the burning state is inflicted upon Aloy by enemies, she'll gradually take 150 damage over a 12 second duration. Inflicting enough frost damage buildup to reach the elemental limit will briefly stagger a machine and apply the brittle state. The brittle state increases all impact, explosive and melee damage by 50 to 100% for 25 seconds. The damage multiplier varies depending on the damage type being dealt and where the machine is hit. Armor plates are also nullified by the brittle state, rendering them ineffective, and shooting components and weak points will still deal bonus damage in addition to the brittle multiplier. This makes Frost one of the most effective elements in the game when it comes to maximizing damage output. When the brittle state is inflicted upon Aloy by enemies, she'll take an additional 20% damage over a 20 second duration. Inflicting enough shock damage buildup to reach the elemental limit will apply the shock to state, causing a machine to collapse to the ground, rendering it completely defenseless. Small machines will be incapacitated for 10 seconds, medium-sized machines for 15 seconds, and larger machines for 20 seconds. When the shock state is inflicted upon Aloy by enemies, she'll be stunned and knocked to the ground, leaving her vulnerable for a short period of time. Inflicting enough purge water buildup to reach the elemental limit will briefly stagger a machine and apply the drenched state. This causes the machine to lose all elemental resistances and immunities, making them susceptible to all elemental damage, while weaknesses remain intact. The drenched state will also remove all elemental damage and buildup from all the machine's attacks that inflict them, as well as completely disabling specific attacks which are primarily based on dealing elemental damage. 
The drenched state will last for 20 seconds on small machines, 25 seconds on medium-sized machines, and 30 seconds on larger machines. When the drenched state is inflicted upon Aloy by enemies, any elemental ammo you use will be rendered ineffective for 25 seconds. Inflicting enough acid damage buildup to reach the elemental limit will briefly stagger a machine and apply the corroding state. Corroding deals a set amount of damage over time to core health every second as well as armor plates every 3.5 seconds, but does not damage components. If enough damage is dealt to armor from the corroding damage, they'll be knocked off the machine. In addition, corroding armor plates allow 80% of the damage Aloy deals to pass through and deal direct damage to health, instead of the usual 20% for unaffected machines or just 5% for Apex machines. A two times critical hit chance is also granted during the corroding state. However, any direct damage received by corroding armor plates is reduced by 50%, which is a small price to pay. The corroding state lasts for 25 seconds on small machines, 30 seconds on medium sized machines, and 35 seconds for larger machines. When the corroding state is inflicted upon Aloy by enemies, she will take 100 damage over a 30 second duration, and outfit resistances will all be reduced by 40%. Inflicting enough plasma damage buildup to reach the elemental limit will briefly stagger a machine and apply the plasma blast state which lasts for 15 seconds. During this time, any damage you deal to the machine will build up a secondary gauge which extends to the right of the plasma blast state icon. If you fail to fill this bar before the 15 seconds is up, the plasma blast state icon will disappear and shortly after, a small, isolated level 1 plasma explosion will hit the machine causing it to stagger and deal 35 damage to small machines, 80 damage to medium sized machines and 200 damage to larger machines. If you manage to fill the secondary bar within the 15 seconds, the plasma blast state icon will disappear and shortly after, a much stronger level 2 plasma explosion will hit the machine causing it to stagger and deal 100 damage to small machines, 240 damage to medium sized machines and 600 damage to larger machines. In addition, level 2 plasma explosions have a large blast radius of 16 meters, causing impact damage and plasma buildup to all surrounding targets including Aloy. When the plasma blast state is inflicted upon Aloy, after 12 seconds a plasma explosion will hit her and drain 35% of her total HP including overhealing. During the 12 second timer you can use a cleanse potion to remove the state, therefore circumventing the resulting explosion. Next up we have the two new non-elemental statuses which are Adhesive and Berserk. Inflicting enough adhesive buildup to reach the status limit will briefly stagger a machine and apply the slowed state for 25 seconds. The slowed state reduces movement speed and prevents machines from jumping and sprinting, as well as disabling fast moving attacks such as charging employed by behemoths and bristlebacks. Adhesive is most effective against flying machines, causing them to crash to the ground and remain grounded until the state ends, as well as agile fast moving machines. When the slowed state is inflicted upon Aloy, her movement speed is drastically hindered and she cannot jump, sprint, slide or dodge for 12 seconds. Inflicting enough Berserk buildup to reach the status limit will briefly stagger a machine and apply the Berserk state for 30 seconds. This causes enemies to attack the nearest target to them, whether that be friend or foe, potentially turning powerful machines against each other without the need for overrides. Berserk is most effective when utilized against multiple enemies in close proximity. There's two states in the game that Aloy cannot be affected by, which are Berserk and Confused. Confused is a state Aloy inflicts upon enemies by dropping smoke bombs, causing them to stagger and become temporarily blind to Aloy's location. Valor Surges are playstyle defining skills that activate very powerful special bonuses for a limited period of time. There's a total of 18 Valor Surge skills to choose from, 3 per skill tree, and they all require Valor to use, which is an exclusive resource represented by the purple bar found directly below the stamina gauge. While all Valor Surges can be unlocked in a single playthrough, only one can be equipped and active at any one time. Each Valor Surge has three levels, granting more powerful effects as you invest more skill points, with an additional passive bonus being awarded when unlocking level 3. 
For each level unlocked, a new segment will be added to the Valor resource bar, extending its duration for a maximum of three segments. At least one segment must be filled before the equipped Valor Surge can be activated. By holding L1 or LB to bring up the weapon wheel, then tapping R1 or RB to activate. The number of segments filled will determine the power level of the Valor Surge when activated. So if you require full level 3 power, make sure all three segments are completely filled. If you activate at 2.5 bars filled, level 2 power will be activated. The only downside is you can't manually deactivate the Valor Surge once it's active. So if you have a full bar, it's best saved for tougher and longer fights. The best overall Valor Surge that covers most playstyles is Ranged Master, which is found on the Hunter skill tree, offering increased damage, heal on hit, and increased stamina regeneration. The Valor Bar will automatically fill every time you deal damage or kill enemies, whether from stealth or direct open combat. Among many other combat actions, including knocking off components, elemental damage, hitting weak spots, performing critical hits, silent strikes, and knockdowns, to name just a few. The more creative you are with how you combine damage types and kill machines, the more Valor you will earn. Weapons come in four distinct qualities. Uncommon greens, rare blues, very rare purples, and orange legendaries. And there's three direct mechanisms that can improve most of these weapons across the board, which are perks, upgrades, and coils. Weapon perks are fixed passive bonuses pre-baked into most weapons, with higher, more powerful perks requiring the weapon to be upgraded at a workbench before unlocking, such as coil slots, overdraw, concentration damage, reload speed, and critical hit stats. Perk information for every owned weapon can be examined on the inventory screen by pressing R2 or RT and scrolling up and down using the D-pad. Uncommon green weapons can have a maximum of two perks, rare blues can have three perks, very rare purples can have four perks, and orange legendaries can have a maximum of five perks. Weapon coils, just like gems in Diablo, are interchangeable modifications that can be equipped into compatible weapons to augment their existing properties or add new ones. Coils also come in four qualities. Uncommon greens, rare blues, very rare purples, and orange legendaries. Almost all the bonuses that fixed weapon perks offer can also be found on coils, allowing a wide range of possible builds for all types of weapon. Elemental coils offer direct boosts to elemental damage and build-up by up to 15%, which are not available as weapon perks, while a handful of purple coils can boost two of these elements at once, while only occupying a single coil slot. Coils can be purchased from most hunter merchants throughout the world, looted from deceased machines, or simply found in chests and containers. Weapon techniques are powerful new abilities unlocked via the skill tree using skill points. And there's anywhere from one to three weapon techniques available for each weapon type, of which only one can be activated at any one time. Weapon techniques require stamina to use, which is represented by this orange gauge, which only appears when you unlock your first weapon technique. Stamina naturally regenerates over time, and the gauge can be permanently extended and regeneration improved by unlocking passive skills on the Hunter skill tree. The ranged master Valor Surge, also on the Hunter skill tree, will also boost stamina regen by 200% while active. Certain outfits, weaves and mills can also improve your stamina bar. All six skill trees in the game have anywhere from two to six weapon techniques for you to unlock and are always represented by this style icon shaped like an upside down diamond. The warrior skill tree has three weapon techniques for the warrior bow. The trapper skill tree has one weapon technique for the trip caster and one for the rope caster. The Hunter skill tree has three techniques for the Hunter Bow and three for the Bolt Blaster. The Survivor skill tree has three techniques for the Blast Sling and three for the Shredder Gauntlet. The Infiltrator skill tree has three techniques for the Sharp Shot Bow. And finally, the Machine Master skill tree has three techniques for the Spike Thrower. Unlocked weapon techniques can be changed on the fly by bringing up the weapon wheel, highlighting the equipped weapon and pushing left or right on the D-pad to select. 
Once selected, they can be activated during gameplay by holding L2 or LT to aim, then tapping R1 or RB to use. I'll be covering every weapon technique available for every weapon in the game, so make sure to stay tuned. There's a total of nine different types of weapon available to Aloy to dispatch her foes. These are hunter bows, warrior bows, sharp shot bows, blast slings, trip casters, rope casters, shredder gauntlets, spike throwers, and bolt blasters. Each of these weapons will use exclusive ammo and higher damage versions will usually require expensive and rare materials to craft. For this reason, it's a good idea to pick up the Workbench Expert skill on the Hunter skill tree which allows you to craft all types of ammo at any workbench using less resources than on the weapon wheel. Hunter bows are versatile weapons featuring the largest selection of arrow types that are mostly cheap to craft. They can be wielded effectively at most ranges, provide an elegant balance between draw speed, precision and power, and their accuracy isn't affected by movement. This positions the hunter bow as Aloy's signature weapon. Just make sure to fully draw the hunter bow for 100% damage by waiting for the reticle to fully close. Loosing an arrow before the reticle closes will result in 50% damage. If your weapon has an overdraw damage perk unlocked, then after fully drawing, you will also see the overdraw halo appear after your main reticle has fully closed. If you wait until the overdraw halo also fully closes, Aloy's arrow will flash blue and your reticle will change from two horizontal lines to four oblique lines. This means you will now deal 100% damage plus additional overdraw damage determined by your weapon's overdraw damage perk and any installed overdraw damage coils. If your weapon does not feature the overdraw damage perk or it hasn't been unlocked by upgrading the weapon, then the overdraw halo will not appear since overdrawing will not be possible. All hunter bows use hunter arrows and there's a total of 14 different types of hunter arrow as shown on this chart. Hunter, Acid, Fire, Frost, Shock, Purge Water, Berserk and Targeting Hunter Arrows. Hunter bows which are compatible with each of these different ammo types are displayed in the right hand column. While advanced arrows deal significantly more damage and build up, keep in mind they require additional and rarer resources to craft. Targeting arrows are exclusive to the hunter bow and have a unique function in that they don't deal damage or build up but will tag machines for attack by all nearby overridden machines for 30 seconds. If a second machine is tagged, it will replace the first machine as the new target, as only a single machine can be tagged at any one time. Due to the very limited situational use of these arrows, they're only worth considering if your playstyle involves regular overriding of machines. And if that is the case, then you'll also want to pick up the Override Overdrive Valor Surge found at the bottom of the Machine Master skill tree. The three available weapon techniques for all hunter bows can be found on the hunter skill tree, which are Triple Notch, Knockdown Shot and High Volley. Triple Notch allows you to notch up to three arrows simultaneously, then loose them all at once for a more powerful but less accurate shot, with three arrows providing the least accuracy. Only 15 stamina is consumed when knocking each additional arrow, and if aiming is cancelled or a different weapon is selected, all arrows remain knocked, allowing you to effectively pre-plan attack strategies for quicker takedown. However, there's a 20% damage and build-up reduction for the second arrow and a 30% reduction for the third knocked arrow, so it's not quite double or triple figures but still adds up to be a significant bonus. The second hunter bow weapon technique is knockdown shot, which works entirely independently of standard knockdown power and consumes 65 stamina per shot. Knockdown shot will always knock down a machine for several seconds, regardless of where on its body the shots land. Normally, for medium and large machines, you have to target the legs. Small machines require a single knockdown shot, mid-sized machines require two shots, and larger machines require three shots for a guaranteed knockdown. And to make things more relaxed, there's no hidden decay timer between shots. However, each shot consumes three arrows, so make sure to have your cheapest arrows selected before unleashing. Knockdown Shot is also very effective against flying machines, quickly grounding them and leaving them vulnerable for several seconds. The final Hunter Bow weapon technique is High Volley, which launches four arrows skyward that rain down on your enemies from above. 
Hitting moving or smaller targets can be tricky, so is most effective against medium or larger machines that are slow moving, stationary or incapacitated by a state. To make up for this situational limitation, impact damage and knockdown power for each arrow is increased by 50%, as well as an increased hit radius of 0.8 meters, increasing their chances to connect. Unfortunately, high volley does not enhance the damage or buildup of elemental arrows, but is particularly effective when used alongside advanced hunter arrows on larger brittle machines, assuming all shots land. If you're finding this video useful, please consider dropping a like and maybe a sub. Most people don't realise just how small my channel is, and any support is always hugely appreciated. Warrior bows are short-ranged quick-fire weapons with a fast reticle speed and accuracy that's not impacted by movement, making them the perfect choice for up-close and personal agile playstyles. Its main drawback is its limited 25 meter range, beyond which it deals zero damage. But to make up for this shortcoming, you do not need to fully draw each shot to deal 100% damage. Quick fire tapping is all that's needed, albeit sacrificing some accuracy which is already on the low side. The overdraw damage perk is still available for some warrior bows, but it's much less important when compared to hunter bows and sharpshot bows. All warrior bows use light arrows, which deal less damage and build up per arrow compared to the hunter and sharpshot bow. However, the much higher rate of fire and times two critical hit bonus more than make up for the shortfall, making the warrior bow one of the fastest weapons to hit elemental limits and quickly build valor points. Light arrows are also very quick and cheap to craft and possess the largest quiver of all three bows. There's a total of six different types of light arrow available for warrior bows, as shown on this chart. Light, shock, acid, frost, fire, and adhesive light arrows. Unlike the hunter and sharpshot bows, there are no advanced arrows for the warrior bow. The warrior bows which are compatible with each of these different ammo types are displayed in the right-hand column. You will not find any berserk, plasma, or purge water light arrows. The critical boost Valor Surge found at the top of the warrior skill tree is particularly effective when used alongside warrior bows, since warrior bows have inherently high base critical hit chance and critical hit damage bonuses of 15% and 200% respectively. Multiple instant state elemental coils are also viable thanks to the high rate of fire. The three available weapon techniques for all warrior bows can be found on the warrior skill tree, which are spread shot, melee detonator and burst fire. Spreadshot allows Aloy to fire off five of her currently selected light arrows simultaneously in a horizontal spread, ideal for triggering elemental limits quickly. Even though fully drawing the weapon while using this technique will increase accuracy, it's still a relatively wide angle. For this reason, Spreadshot should only be utilized against medium to large size machines while at close range, increasing the chances of all five arrows hitting the target. Spreadshot will consume 30 stamina per shot. The second warrior bow technique is melee detonator, which fires a special highly explosive arrow that sticks to enemies for 30 seconds and detonates as soon as you hit the target with a melee attack using your spear. Up to four of these special arrows can be attached to a target at any one time, with each shot consuming two arrows as well as 25 stamina. Each additional arrow will add 25% damage to the resulting explosion, up to a maximum of plus 75% damage. If four arrows are exceeded, the oldest arrow is removed without exploding. The type of arrow selected does not affect the function or effect of this technique, so make sure to use the cheapest arrows available. Melee Detonator is most useful against human enemies and smaller machines, where you're more likely to engage in melee combat, and slipping in a few Detonator arrows in between combos will give you a huge upper hand. The final Warrior Bow weapon technique is Burst Fire, which is similar to Spread Shot but fires 3 arrows instead of 5, and consumes 25 stamina per shot. Its tighter spread makes it more effective against smaller machines and can quickly trigger elemental limits. Targeting larger components at close range with burst fire is also an effective tactic. Sharpshot bows are long-range sniper weapons which deal high damage with pinpoint accuracy, ideal for targeting weak spots, volatile sacks and high-value components. 
They have a plus 25% overdraw damage bonus, as well as a 250% critical hit damage bonus. So when you want to dish out as much impact damage as accurately as possible, and in as few shots as possible, sharp shot bows are the ideal choice. To balance their immense power, range and accuracy, sharp shot bows have a number of drawbacks. They're slow to reload, have a slow rate of fire, need to be fully drawn to deal 100% damage, and to maintain accuracy, Aloy needs to be stationary. Aloy's movement speed is also severely hampered while aiming the sharp shot bow, and during a slide, aiming will immediately interrupt the slide rather than activating the quick draw slow-mo. All sharp shot bows use precision arrows which are relatively expensive and slow to craft and its quiver size is the smallest of all three bows, maxing out at just 15. There's a total of eight different types of precision arrows available for sharp shot bows as shown on this chart. Precision, Advanced Precision, Knockdown, Advanced Knockdown, Plasma, Advanced Plasma, Tear and Strike Through arrows. The sharp shot bows which are compatible with each of these different ammo types are displayed in the right hand column. There's also a ninth ammo type called Elite Precision Arrows, which are compatible with only one sharp shot bow in the game, the legendary Irivs Downfall, which is exclusive to New Game Plus. Its Elite Arrows are an improved version of Advanced Precision Arrows, making it the most powerful sharp shot bow in the game. Precision, Advanced Precision and Elite Precision Arrows are among the most powerful ammo types in the game, dealing large amounts of both impact damage and tear, with raw damage being their main strength. For long range, highly accurate, maximum damage sniping, where mobility and speed are not essential, these arrows should be your first port of call. Just make sure to avoid hitting armor plates without first applying brittle or corroding, otherwise most of their damage will be mitigated. Plasma and Advanced Plasma Precision Arrows excel at applying the Plasma Blast state to even the largest machines, as well as efficiently igniting Glow Blast canisters from a distance. As a reminder, triggering the associated elemental canister with advanced ammo types will always double the blast radius of the resulting explosion. Both Plasma and Advanced Plasma Precision Arrows deal a large amount of knockdown power, ideal for inflicting staggers and knockdowns while in the process of building up the elemental state. Knockdown Precision Arrows deal reduced impact damage in exchange for much higher knockdown power. Once a machine is knocked down, it collapses to the floor and a knockdown timer will appear above its head. During this time, it will remain vulnerable, allowing for unanswered follow-up attacks or easy component removal. Smaller machines can be knocked down by hitting them anywhere with a single shot, whereas medium to heavyweight machines need to be hit directly on the legs, usually multiple times before a knockdown occurs. Tear precision arrows are by far the best method for removing components quickly and efficiently, and soon become an essential tool for acquiring key upgrade resources. They deal minimal damage upon impact, but after a short delay, explode, dishing out a huge amount of tear damage with a 1.5 meter radius. Tear arrows are expensive to craft and have a lengthy crafting time, so be sure to plan your attacks accordingly and craft them at workbenches whenever possible. Strikethrough precision arrows are capable of piercing through targets and hitting multiple enemies behind in the same shot. They're also very effective against armoured enemies, suffering just a 20% damage reduction as opposed to the usual 80% from most other damage sources. Just make sure to headshot heavily armoured humans for maximum effect. However, against Apex machine variants, the damage reduction from armour plates is increased to 60%. Strike through precision arrows cannot, however, hit multiple parts on the same target or hit components underneath armour. Make sure to avoid using instant chance status coils due to the slow rate of fire. The power shots and range to master valor surges found on the hunter skill tree, as well as stealth stalker found on the infiltrator skill tree, are all particularly effective when used alongside the high base damage of sharp shot bows. There's three weapon techniques available for sharp shot bows which can all be found on the infiltrator skill tree, which are braced shot, double notch and focused shot. Braced shot is a powerful arrow that consumes 80 stamina 
deals a high amount of explosive damage and a high amount of knockdown power, similar to that of advanced knockdown precision arrows. Braced shot negates armor thanks to its explosive damage and can instantly destroy weaker machines and will likely stagger and severely damage larger machines. The main drawback is while aiming, where Aloy needs to remain stationary to steady herself on one knee, therefore restricting her reticle aiming movement to 90 degrees. Braced shot consumes three standard precision arrows, or two arrows of any other type with each shot. The explosive damage dealt directly increases with your sharpshot bow's rarity and upgrade level. The second sharpshot bow weapon technique is double notch, which is similar to the triple notch weapon technique for the hunter bow. Double notch allows you to notch up to two arrows simultaneously, then loose them both at once for a more powerful but less accurate shot. Just like triple notch, the main drawback of double notch is the reduced accuracy, making it trickier to land precise shots on weak spots or components at long range. 50 stamina is consumed when knocking the second arrow, and if aiming is cancelled or if a different weapon is selected, the second arrow will still remain knocked. However, there's a 30% damage and build-up reduction for the second arrow, so while it's not quite double figures, it's still a worthwhile bonus. The final sharpshot bow weapon technique is focused shot, which increases impact damage by 30%, increases zoom level by 250%, and costs 35 stamina per shot. Due to the percentage-based damage bonus of this technique, it benefits the most from advanced precision arrows on an upgraded sharpshot bow with impact damage coils installed. Focus Shot also increases the tear damage dealt on tear precision arrows, as well as the total damage of strike through arrows, so it's well worth using this technique with these arrow types when the opportune moments arise. Blast slings are medium to long range weapons which launch bombs that follow an arc trajectory and benefit from relatively short full draw and reload times. Explosive payloads are great at dishing out high damage without having to aim for weak spots since they bypass armor, the only drawback being components caught in the blast are destroyed rather than dislodged. There's a total of 8 different types of bomb available for the blast sling, as shown on this chart. Explosive, Advanced Explosive, Cluster, Frost, Purge Water, Fire, Acid and Adhesive. The blast links, which are compatible with each of these different ammo types are displayed in the right hand column. Cluster bombs act similar to explosive bombs but instead will split into smaller projectiles while in mid-air, therefore covering a wider area of effect. For this reason, it's best to never use cluster bombs at close range, as the damage dealt from an unsplit cluster bomb is much less than a regular explosive bomb. It's also a good idea to overdraw cluster bombs whenever possible, as this will not only increase the number of clusters created, but will also increase the area of effect covered by the explosions. Elemental bombs come in four varieties. Frost, purge water, fire and acid. They explode on direct contact with the target or the environment, which deals damage, elemental buildup and residual AOE buildup for a short period of time. Elemental bombs excel at quickly triggering elemental limits at short, medium and long ranges. Although be careful at very close range as Aloy can take damage and build up from the initial blast as well as the elemental residual puddles. Adhesive bombs inflict the slowed state on enemies once the status limit has been reached. They deal no damage, but are the only ammo type that can inflict the slowed state at long distances. Just like elemental bombs, adhesive bombs leave temporary puddles on the ground, which contribute to the build-up when enemies stand in them. As it stands, it would have been much more beneficial if slowed was combined with something like purge water. Just like warrior bows, blast slings have a high default 15% critical hit chance bonus, so installing crit hit chance and crit hit damage coils will play to its strengths, as well as installing coils which bolster the damage or build up of your most used types of bomb. The three available weapon techniques for blast slings can all be found down the left hand side of the survivor skill tree, which are bouncing bomb, burst dodge and sticky bomb. Bouncing Bomb consumes two bombs per shot, with a relatively low 30 stamina, and always deals explosive damage regardless of the ammo type selected. Bouncing Bombs will bounce twice before exploding, given the space. 
and each bounce will increase the damage, knockdown power and blast radius of the explosion by 100%. So it's in your best interest to provide ample space to ensure both bounces land before hitting the target for the plus 200% damage bonus. Finally, never aim bouncing bombs directly at the target, as you would with explosive bombs. Otherwise, the damage dealt will be significantly reduced, wasting the shot. The second blastling weapon technique is Burst Dodge, which disperses 5 bombs and consumes 80 stamina per shot. When performing this technique, Aloy will dodge backwards, which has a short duration of invulnerability, and throw 5 of your currently selected bombs in a wide arc in front of her. The utility of the dodge, alongside the large spread of the bombs, makes it useful against multiple targets in close proximity. However, the number of bombs thrown will depend on the amount of ammo currently available. This limitation, together with the high stamina consumption, make it the least effective weapon technique for the Blastling. The final Blastling weapon technique is Sticky Bomb, which makes your currently selected ammo type stick to targets and after an 8 second delay, explode, dealing their usual damage and elemental buildup. A maximum of 3 bombs can be stuck to a machine at any one time, with an additional 25% damage bonus for each additional bomb attached beyond the first one. As soon as the third bomb sticks, they will all instantly explode automatically. This means to get the full 50% damage bonus, you need to attach the final third bomb within the 8 second timer of the first bomb being attached. The only bomb that does not deal impact damage are adhesive bombs, which will only apply the status buildup upon exploding. Tripcasters lay down trip wires between two manually placed metal spikes, which then trigger a trap when an enemy, or Aloy herself, comes into contact with them. By upgrading the resilient trapper skill to level 4 on the trapper skill tree will cause Aloy to become completely immune to all her own traps. Tripcasters are best utilised as support tools prior to combat, to set up trip wires along a machine's patrol route preemptively from stealth. Tripwires can be stacked in close proximity to detonate simultaneously and increase damage, but there's a limit to how many traps you can place at any one time. At first, only two traps can be deployed, but this can be increased via the trap limit skill on the trapper skill tree. To unlock the maximum 8 simultaneous traps at level 4, just like other skills at level 4, you'll also need the additional boosts provided from outfit perks and installed weaves. You can disassemble existing tripwires if they're no longer required, but you'll receive fewer resources than the initial cost. You can increase the recovered resources via the skilled salvager skill on the trapper skill tree. But once again, to unlock max level 4, you'll need the additional boosts from outfit perks and outfit weaves. There's certain areas where tripwires cannot be placed, indicated by a wider reticle with a circle instead of a dot. There's no ammo cost if you accidentally misplace the first metal spike. However, ammo will be lost if the second spike doesn't anchor. It's also worth noting that enemies will remain completely unaware of traps and won't reveal your location when detonated, making tripwires the perfect tool for stealth-focused playstyles. There's a total of 7 different types of tripwire available for tripcasters, as shown on this chart. Explosive, Advanced Explosive, Shock, Fire, plasma, shield wires and stagger beams. The tripcasters which are compatible with each of these different ammo types are displayed in the right hand column. Explosive tripwires, as you would expect, deal a high amount of explosive damage which bypasses armour, while inflicting a high amount of knockdown power from the blast. The advanced version significantly increases damage and power at the cost of expensive crafting and slower crafting times. As is the case when crafting all advanced ammo, upgrading the ammo expert skill to level 2 and unlocking the workbench expert skill, both found on the hunter skill tree, is recommended. Elemental tripwires will explode when triggered, dealing a small amount of elemental damage and a large amount of elemental buildup. Fire and plasma tripwires will leave residual puddles on the floor, further adding to the damage and buildup for a short period of time. However, shock wires are especially useful, making otherwise difficult combat encounters much more manageable, buying you ample time to stack up unanswered damage. Shield wires allow you to create a defensive shield between two anchor points in close proximity, which can stop projectiles and explosions but cannot stop melee attacks. 
As the shield takes damage, its health will deteriorate and once depleted, it will explode causing damage to nearby enemies. However, unlike other tripwire explosions, this does not cause damage to Aloy. While no projectiles can penetrate the shield from either direction, its irregular shape allows Aloy to shoot from behind while remaining mostly protected. Stagger beams create laser beams between two anchor points that deal very high knockdown power as well as consistent impact damage over time, making them the perfect tripwire for charging machines such as behemoths and bristlebacks. The beams remain active for 15 seconds after first dealing any damage, before automatically deactivating. If a machine remains in the beam's path, it will continuously take impact damage over time until the beam deactivates. There's only a single weapon technique for tripcasters called Quick Wire, which allows tripcasters to become a more viable option during open combat. Quick Wire launches a single projectile of the currently selected ammo type and quickly deploys a tripwire of a fixed length, ideal for tripping charging machines. The only drawback of quickwire is the short duration of the wires after deployment, which would automatically explode or deactivate after 25 seconds for explosive or elemental trip wires and 45 seconds for shield wires and stagger beams. For this reason, quickwire should only be deployed during open combat, when it's obvious an enemy will trigger the trap in a short space of time. Rope casters are primarily used to build the tied down state on machines using binding ropes, taking them out of the fight for up to 90 seconds. However, to anchor ropes onto armor plates, the rope caster has to be fully drawn, and this is achieved by waiting for the initial reticle to fully close. The instant you see the overdraw halo appear, the weapon is already fully drawn. You do not need to overdraw the weapon. If you do overdraw, then this will slightly increase the binding power and build up meter of your shot. If you don't see the overdraw halo appear, then either the weapon does not have the overdraw perk, or you simply need to upgrade the weapon to unlock it. As you successfully attach ropes to a machine, the binding power build-up meter, also known as the tie-down meter, will appear and will start to fill with color. Once the limit is reached, the machine will be tied down for 90 seconds, as indicated by the gradually declining white circle. As you deal damage to the machine while it's tied down, this will knock precious seconds off the timer, depending on the amount of damage dealt. For this reason, it's a good idea to inflict an elemental state such as brittle while the machine is tied down, since the damage dealt will be minimal and the elemental buildup will bypass armor. As a bonus, once the elemental limit is triggered, the tied down state will remain active, giving you additional time to set up your next move, whether that be dish out more damage, remove components, or target weak spots. The rope caster can also benefit from the hidden quick draw mechanic which automatically activates when aiming during a slide. Quick draw enables faster draw time and charging of your weapon, and activates a brief period of slow motion with some aim assist, all while remaining mobile to avoid attacks. Quick draw is a great companion for applying ropes with the rope caster. Since all rope caster ammo types require fully drawn shots to attach to armor, adding draw speed coils will be highly beneficial. Overdraw damage calls will also increase the binding power buildup of your ropes, reducing the number of ropes required to trigger a tied down state, assuming you overdraw your shots. Rope casters use ropes or harpoons, and there's 11 different types of ammunition available as shown on this chart. Binding ropes, advanced binding ropes, shock ropes, plasma ropes, and canister harpoons, which come in seven varieties. Fire, shock, acid, frost, purge water, plasma, and explosive. The rope casters, which are compatible with each of these different ammo types, are displayed in the right-hand column. Advanced binding ropes are only used by the very rare elite and legendary the tie that binds rope casters. As usual, with all advanced ammo types, they're more expensive and slower to craft, but offer a significant increase to binding power buildup and double the tear damage upon detachment. Elemental ropes come in just two varieties, either shock or plasma. In addition to tying down machines, elemental ropes deal an initial explosion of elemental damage and build-up, then continuously inflict damage and build-up which courses up through the ropes for as long as they remain attached to the machine. Each additional rope attached will stack their damage and build-up on top of the existing ropes. This all sounds well and good, but as you'd expect, there's several drawbacks we need to cover. Firstly, the binding power of elemental ropes is very weak, 
being just half that of standard binding ropes. Secondly, the elemental buildup applied is very slow, certainly much slower than the buildup applied by other weapons. And finally, the period of time machines remain tied down is much shorter than non-elemental ropes, since there's continuous damage being dealt to the machine while it's tied down. For this reason, elemental ropes are the weakest ammunition type for the rope caster. The final type of rope caster ammo are canister harpoons, which come in seven varieties. Fire, shock, acid, frost, purge water, plasma and explosive. Canister harpoons can be stuck to a machine anywhere you can shoot it, and once attached will behave like regular elemental canisters, in as much as shooting it with the matching elemental type will trigger a large explosion, causing high damage and buildup to the target and nearby machines. As with all canisters, detonating them with advanced ammo types will create a larger explosion radius. Rope caster canisters attach to machines via harpoons, which causes them to flap around unpredictably, especially when attached to highly mobile machines. For this reason, it's best to use concentration when lining up your shot and when a machine is relatively stationary or incapacitated. Otherwise, they can be frustratingly difficult to target. Canister harpoons will stay attached for 30 seconds, but this can be increased to 60 seconds if you overdraw your weapon. After this time, they'll detach and lay on the ground where you can still loot or detonate them. However, the biggest drawback is when an elemental canister explodes, as it will not trigger any adjacent canisters that you may have also attached. This means you'll need to trigger each canister with a projectile of its own, which limits the overall effectiveness. A good tactic would be to use the triple notch weapon technique on hunter bows to trigger multiple canisters simultaneously. Of all the seven types of canister harpoons, explosive canisters are the only type that also trigger adjacent canisters for stacking massive damage. Not only that, unlike elemental canisters, explosive canisters can be set off by inflicting any type of damage to them, elemental or not, making them much more effective during combat. If you're having trouble triggering explosive canisters attached to highly mobile machines, then any ammo that deals AOE explosive damage, such as the Blastling's explosive bombs, are ideal. There's only a single weapon technique for rope casters called Penetrating Rope, which is found on the Trapper skill tree and consumes 40 stamina per shot. Penetrating Rope is a more powerful binding rope, and its power increases depending on the quality and upgrade level of your weapon. It doesn't consume any ammo, doesn't need to be fully drawn to attach to armor, and it doesn't matter which ammo type you have selected. If you have a high quality, fully upgraded rope caster, then penetrating rope will significantly reduce the time to tie down machines. Shredder gauntlets are medium to long range mechanical devices that launch metal shredder discs, which grind into enemies causing impact damage, tear, damage over time, and elemental buildup before returning to Aloy like a boomerang. Shredder gauntlets require a higher skill level than any other weapon in the game. Therefore, to unlock their true potential, intentional practice must be prioritized. After successfully hitting an enemy, shredder discs will return, allowing them to be caught, charged up again, and rethrown. Fully charging up a throw, indicated by the reticle becoming a full circle, will slightly increase the grinding damage over time. This process can be repeated up to three times, as indicated by the three dots located directly below the reticle, gaining significantly more power with each successful catch. Upon the fourth successful hit, the disc will explode, inflicting massive impact damage and tear, peaking at around 400%. If you miss a catch, the damage multiplier will be reset, and you'll need to begin the whole process again. It's also worth noting that Shredder Disc ammo will only be consumed when they either explode on the fourth hit, you miss the target when shooting, or you miss the catch on return. Every time you successfully catch a returning disc, it will be added back into your pool of available ammunition. When a Shredder Disc returns to Aloy after successfully grinding into an enemy, it will return in a horizontal arc, homing in toward the direction Aloy is travelling in. To take advantage of this natural homing trajectory, make sure to maintain Aloy's direction of travel when the disc leaves its target. The disc will return to Aloy faster after each successful throw, so it's a good idea to use roll if you need to close the distance quickly. When Aloy is positioned within a 1.7 meter distance from the disc, it will be automatically caught and reloaded into the gauntlet ready to be relaunched. 
there's a total of six different types of shredder ammunition available for shredder gauntlets, as shown on this chart. Shredders, advanced shredders, piercing shredders, tear shredders, acid shredders and shock shredders. The shredder gauntlets which are compatible with each of these different ammo types are displayed in the right hand column. Shredders and advanced shredders both deal impact and tear damage as soon as they hit the target and continue to grind into the enemy dealing additional damage and tear over a short period of time. After catching the returning disc three times in a row, they will explode on the fourth successful hit, dealing a large amount of explosive damage and tear. Piercing shredders function in the exact same way as standard shredders, dealing both impact damage and tear, with the advantage of ignoring the damage reduction from armour plates. So, there's no need to apply the brittle state first with piercing shredders, unless of course you want to stack the bonus damage multiplier. Tear shredders do exactly what you'd expect them to do, deal a large amount of tear damage with markedly less impact damage. For this reason, tear shredders should only be used if your focus is component removal. The final fourth explosion of tear shredders will deal a large amount of tear damage as well as some explosive damage, but the explosive damage is to a much lesser degree than the aforementioned standard and piercing shredders. There's just two varieties of elemental shredders, acid and shock with shock being the more useful. Elemental shredders deal increasing amounts of impact damage, tear and elemental buildup with each shot, and on the fourth explosion deal a large amount of elemental damage, buildup and tear. Elemental shredders also benefit from a much wider tear damage radius when grinding into machines, affecting multiple components and armour plates in a wide area surrounding the point of impact. Effective coils to use with shredder gauntlets are concentration damage, impact damage, tear damage, damage over time, draw speed, reload speed and acid and shock coils for the two elemental shredders. There's three weapon techniques for shredder gauntlets which all can be found on the right hand side of the survivor skill tree, which are triple shredder, shredder mine and power shredder. As the name implies, Triple Shredder launches three shredders simultaneously in a horizontal spread and consumes a relatively low 30 stamina per shot. Just like single shredders, triple shredders can also be charged to increase the grinding damage over time of all three discs. All three shredders will return after damaging a target, but only a single shredder can be caught as per the normal function of the weapon. Upon activating the triple shredder technique, any previously charged up shredder that has not yet exploded will be lost. Triple shredder works especially well when using elemental shredders, greatly increasing the elemental buildup if all three discs hit the target. Due to the relatively widespread of the triple shredders technique, it's best utilised against medium to heavyweight machines. The second weapon technique is Shredder Mine, which consumes a relatively low 30 stamina per shot and launches an electrified shredder which hovers above the ground, dealing shock damage and build-up to surrounding enemies within an 8 meter radius. After hovering for 10 seconds, the shredder will automatically explode, dealing a final burst of shock damage and build-up. If you directly hit a target with the mine, it will deal a small amount of impact damage and knockdown power, but the enemy will be alerted to your presence. The best way to use the mines is from stealth, aiming the mine to hit the floor within an 8 meter radius of the enemy. This way you remain undetected, and if you can place the mine to affect multiple enemies in close proximity, would make a great opener for initiating combat. As shredder mines consume a relatively low amount of stamina, strategically placing multiple mines in quick succession is particularly effective. The final third weapon technique for shredder gauntlets is Power Shredder, which consumes 40 stamina and always deals explosive damage upon impact regardless of the ammo selected. Power Shredder is a slower moving projectile that travels long distance and upon hitting a target will explode dealing a large amount of explosive damage, tear and knockdown power in a 4 meter radius. Due to the significant amount of tear damage dealt in a wide 4 meter radius, Power Shredder is also a great technique for stripping multiple components. Spike throwers are medium to long range weapons that allow Aloy to launch javelin like projectiles in a high arc, hitting enemies from above and dealing a high amount of damage and knockdown power upon impact. Spikes are fairly expensive to craft and travel relatively slowly, and due to their low agility are best served as support weapons when a large amount of damage needs to be dished out quickly. 
Overdrawing spike throwers increases overall damage dealt by a default base of 15%, as well as increasing knockdown power by 50%, easily interrupting attacks, staggering or even knocking down larger machines. Just like the rope caster, spikes must be fully charged in order for them to stick into armor plates, otherwise they'll just bounce off. A fully charged shot is achieved the moment the three downward pointing reticle chevrons close together. You do not need to overdraw the weapon for a fully charged shot. Charged shots will also travel farther and faster and will not suffer a damage penalty during the initial impact. As a general rule, you want to keep your target at around medium range and line up the lowest smallest chevron of the reticle to be just above the point where you want the spike to land. There's a total of six different types of spikes available for spike throwers as shown on this chart. Explosive, Advanced Explosive, Impact, Fire, Plasma and Drill Spikes. The spike throwers which are compatible with each of these different ammo types are displayed in the right hand column. Explosive and Advanced Explosive spikes initially deal impact damage as soon as they hit the machine, then after a short delay will explode dealing a large amount of explosive damage in a 3 meter radius as well as significant knockdown power. Explosive spikes are expensive to craft and should be saved for tougher enemies when you need to inflict a high amount of raw damage with no concern for component salvage. Against human opponents, explosive spikes will automatically explode upon impact and are particularly effective against the much tougher, heavily armoured variants. It goes without saying, slotting explosive damage coils would be highly beneficial here. Impact spikes specifically deal impact damage and knockdown power the moment they hit the target, and nothing more. Although they deal less damage than explosive, they're much cheaper to craft and can be used more frequently. Elemental spikes come in two flavours, fire and plasma. These will deal a moderate amount of impact damage on the initial hit, then after a short delay, explode dealing elemental damage and build up of the associated type. Drill spikes deal impact damage, tear damage and a large amount of knockdown power on the initial hit, then continue to drill down into the machine to further deal both impact and tear damage over time for up to 15 seconds. Slotting damage over time and knockdown power coils would be highly beneficial when utilizing drill spikes. To take advantage of their very high knockdown power, which is the highest of any ammo type in the game, remember to aim for the legs on medium to heavyweight machines or their knockdown power will be mitigated. Drill spikes and explosive spikes are by far the two best ammo types available for spike throwers. There's three weapon techniques for spike throwers which can all be found on the Machine Master skill tree, which are Spike Trap, Propelled Spike and Splitting Spike. Spike Trap allows Aloy to embed metal spike traps into the ground which act just like regular traps, dealing explosive or elemental damage depending on the ammo type selected. Spike traps consume a medium amount of stamina and should be carefully placed along patrol routes from stealth, which will trigger when an enemy moves in close proximity. As a bonus, Aloy cannot trigger spike traps and take damage like from regular traps, but once spike traps are set, they cannot be recovered. You can also easily aim spike traps directly at enemies thanks to its highlighted trajectory, which will instantly explode on impact just like an explosive bomb. Propelled spike consumes a large amount of stamina and 2-4 to four spikes per shot depending on the ammo type selected. Regardless, propelled spike will always deal explosive damage and knock down power upon detonation. The main consideration of Propelled Spike is its ability to explode as it enters close proximity of a target, rather than a direct hit, so accuracy is not a requirement, making it especially useful for fast moving and flying machines. However, due to the high stamina cost and expensive ammo requirements, Propelled Spike is the weakest technique for the spike thrower. Splitting Spike consumes a medium amount of stamina and a single spike per shot, which will be thrown skyward in a very high arc then split into six mini projectiles. Landing just two of the projectiles will still deal more damage than a single spike alone, so if you're able to land all six mini spikes, which is the tricky part, the resulting damage or elemental buildup is potentially huge. After splitting, the six projectiles will retain the same behavior as the original ammo type selected. Impact, Explosive, Fire or Plasma. Splitting Spike is best utilized against larger, slower moving machines and conditions where landing all six spikes is more likely.
bolt blasters are heavy, rapid fire mechanical weapons that fire large bolts at medium range and capable of dealing serious burst damage quickly. Since none of the bolt blaster ammo types deal any tear damage, it's all about high, raw damage destruction and not components removal. Rapidly tap firing, the bolt blaster will fire three bolts in quick succession at reduced damage and low accuracy at a range of 40 meters. Charging the shots by waiting for the initial reticle to fully close will fire six bolts at full damage with good accuracy at an extended range of 50 meters. And fully overdrawing the weapon if overdraw is unlocked will fire six bolts with 15% bonus damage and 20% more accuracy than fully charged shots. And the range is also increased to the maximum 60 meters. As a reminder, the weapon is overdrawn when the overdraw halo fully closes the tip of the loaded bolt flashes blue and the reticle changes from two horizontal lines to four oblique lines. When Aloy holds the bolt blaster in her hands, her movement speed is slow to almost a walking pace and her dodge roll changes from an evasive forward roll to a clumsy short range dive, which not only leaves her vulnerable but also takes her far longer to recover. However, this can easily be mitigated by quickly tapping the sprint button just before initiating a dodge roll. The main drawback of the Bolt Blaster is its long-winded reloading animation, which is not only very slow, as Aloy has to remain stationary while she rests the bulky weapon on the ground, but the whole drawn-out process is required every time you change ammo types, which leaves her dangerously open to attack. Because of this, the Bolt Blaster is the only weapon in the game that has a clip gauge directly below the reticle. Luckily, in emergency situations, you can cancel the reload mid-animation by either performing a melee attack or a dodge, but dodging will perform the awkward short-range dive. However, the most reliable method is by quick-swapping your weapon, which is a mechanic that's enabled on the controls menu under settings. Weapon quick-swapping can also be used to cancel the remainder of the reload animation once you see the Bolt Blaster magazine has been refreshed at the bottom right of the screen. There's a total of seven different types of ammunition available for the Bolt Blaster as shown on this chart. Bolts, Advanced Bolts, Piercing Bolts, Shock Bolts, Frost Bolts, Plasma Bolts and Explosive Bolts. The Bolt Blasters which are compatible with each of these different ammo types are displayed in the right hand column. Bolts and Advanced Bolts both exclusively deal impact damage and do not deal any other type of damage. For this reason, they excel at dishing out raw destructive power in a short space of time, when you have no concern for component removal. As usual with impact damage, remember to first apply the brittle or corroding state before hitting armor plates. Piercing bolts, just like standard bolts, specifically deal impact damage, but with the advantage of having a lower damage penalty when striking armor plates. Standard machine armor will mitigate just 20% of piercing damage, while Apex machine armor will mitigate a much more substantial 60%. Piercing bolts are especially useful against heavily armored human opponents, as well as machines with advanced nano plating, such as Spectres, since nano plating is especially vulnerable to piercing damage. All three elemental bolts, shock, frost, and plasma, exclusively deal their respective elemental damage and build up but don't deal any impact damage or tear. As a bonus, elemental bolts are the only other ammo type besides arrows that can trigger elemental canisters. The hunter bow is still unmatched for this purpose, but for fast moving machines, a spread of multiple bolts may prove more likely to hit the mark. Explosive bolts deal impact damage upon first striking the target, then after a two second delay, will explode dealing additional explosive damage. They're particularly effective against highly defensive human opponents, as well as stronger machines where a sudden burst of raw damage is called for, but due to their expensive crafting requirements, should not be used too often. Impact damage, elemental and explosive damage coils would be beneficial here, and it's also recommended to slot reload speed and draw speed coils, which will help mitigate the considerably slower operation of these weapons. There's three weapon techniques for Bolt Blasters which can all be found down the right hand side of the Hunter skill tree, which are Spread Blast, Sustained Burst and Ultra Shot. 
Spread Blast consumes a relatively high 65 stamina and fires up to 8 bolts of the currently selected type in a widespread shotgun-like blast without the need for charging. This technique is highly effective at close range to deal huge damage and elemental build-up against larger machines where all bolts are more likely to land. Spread Blast should only be used if you have at least 8 bolts remaining in your magazine for a full spread. Otherwise, you'll lose out on potential damage. Since Spread Blast is tap-fired for maximum damage, its speed is an important factor here, ideal for quickly responding to close-range emergencies. Sustained Burst consumes a significant 100 stamina per use, and after a brief automatic wind-up, completely empties the clip of your currently selected ammo in a rapid-fire stream of 10 rounds per second. The potential damage output of this technique is huge, especially combined with the ranged Master Valor Surge and if a machine is in the brittle or corroding state. The main drawback of Sustained Burst is Aloy is a sitting duck until the technique ends, which can last for several seconds depending on the size of your clip. The legendary Blast Forge can hold up to 50 advanced bolts or 50 piercing bolts in a single clip, shredding enemies for an extended amount of time, assuming your aiming ensures the entire clip finds its target. For this reason, it's best to use sustained burst on larger, slower moving machines, and before committing, ensuring Aloy isn't in immediate danger of being interrupted. However, if you interrupt the technique yourself by letting go of the aim button or by dodging, the entire remainder of your clip will be lost, forcing you to reload or swap weapons. Ultra Shot consumes a medium amount of stamina per use, and after a brief automatic charge up, zooms in for easier aiming. It then unleashes 10 bolts simultaneously in a relatively tight spread, all at high speed with a long 80 meter range. Ultrashot can hit multiple targets simultaneously that are in close proximity, thanks to its large blast radius upon impact. If fewer than 10 bolts are available in your clip, Ultrashot will still fire at full damage, as long as it's not completely empty. So this is the perfect way to spend your last few bolts to maximize damage. As Ultrashot will always deal a high amount of explosive damage and knockdown power, regardless of ammo selected, make sure to select your cheapest ammo type available. To maximize damage output, install as many explosive damage coils as you can. As is the case with all high-powered ranged weapon techniques, the ranged Master Valor Surge will be highly beneficial here. Finally, we have the unique Spectre Gauntlet, which is a modified version of a powerful Zenith weapon, and is acquired as part of the Burning Shores DLC main story. This weapon differs from every other weapon in the game, in that there's only one of its type, it doesn't have perks, its power cannot be upgraded, and it cannot be coiled. Wielding the Spectre Gauntlet effectively transforms the combat of the game into a sci-fi, arcade-style third-person shooter. The Gauntlet has two modes of fire, of which the first is called Shield Barrage, which rapidly fires inaccurate blue energy projectiles that deal 40 explosive damage and 60 tear damage per projectile. Holding down the fire button will rapidly fire 10 projectiles before the weapon overheats, requiring a 4 second cooldown before it can be properly fired again. You can circumvent this overheating mechanic by quickly tap firing the weapon rather than holding it down. Although as you'd expect, this can have a negative impact on aiming, especially while strafing. The second mode of fire is called Railgun, which is obtained as an optional upgrade during side quest in his wake. The railgun needs to be manually charged up for a couple of seconds before firing, and shoots a long-range, highly accurate piercing beam that deals 250 impact damage and 500 tear damage. Railgun beams are capable of piercing through targets and hitting multiple enemies behind in the same shot. Holding the charge for more than 7 seconds without releasing the beam will overheat the weapon and require a cooldown before it can be charged up again. There's a single weapon technique for the Spectre Gauntlet called Designator, which consumes a low amount of stamina. Designator has a different function depending on which ammo type you have selected. With the Rapid Fire Shield Barrage, a yellow Designator is placed on your target of choice, and all your Shield Barrage projectiles will increase their explosive damage from 40 to 50, as well as change colour from blue to yellow, indicating they'll automatically home in on the Designated target. The designator will disappear after being attached for 15 seconds, or if the component it's attached to is destroyed or removed. 
With the railgun selected, the designator placed on the target will be blue instead of yellow. And if you can hit the designator with the railgun, it will significantly increase the damage dealt. The brittle state is particularly effective when used alongside the railgun, doubling its impact damage from 250 to 500, and also applies a 20% damage increase to shield barrage projectiles. If you found this video useful, please consider dropping a like and maybe subscribing. Any support is always hugely appreciated. As usual, it's Jay. Thanks so much for watching.